Unleashed. This is London's Free Thinking Comedy Club. That does not mean that we are here to be offensive. It just means that we are here to laugh at comedy, understanding that none of this is meant specifically to be about you, you fucker. It's not about you! Is it? Oh, that's very disappointing. I'm so sorry, madam. This is the Comedy Unleashed podcast with me, Andrew Doyle, and Jodie Farah. Hello. And uh, we've, uh, we're very delighted to have Andrew Lawrence with us, who has just literally come off stage at Comedy Unleashed. Andrew, how are you doing? Oh, good, yeah. Well, great fun. Fantastic how was, gig. How was the gig? It was lovely. It was great fun. Yeah, yeah. Really, really mixed, uh, really mi- real mixture of people and uh, what an incredible thing for a Tuesday night. To have <laughs> a, a proper gig. There's not many of those around anymore. <laughs> we, it used to be. Yeah, they, they did used to be, but... So, in terms of like uh, just generally the comedy scene at the moment, can I ask you about like have you? Know, uh, we were speaking uh, the other time to another comic who was talking about how she feels that audiences have changed over the past ten years. Do you, do you get any sense of that, or do you think people are just the same? I think um, audiences are, are, are pretty much the same. I think it depends where you're gigging, I suppose, but it's always dependent on where you're gigging. Audiences are different everywhere, and that's part of the skill of a comedian is to read the read the room you're in. Um, and I think acts are generally the, the same as well. In a, in a, when you go to a club gig and you're on with other acts, I think everyone's pretty much, oh, yeah, as long as it's funny, anything goes. Yeah. To what um, extent do you alter what you do according to how you read the room? I, I think I would have... I, I've, I've definitely got a set of, of material that I do at, at kind of rowdy, drunken weekend yeah. gigs. Um but I, I wouldn't talk to my set in terms of what I thought might upset or offend people. I'd alter it in terms of of what kind of attention span is in the room. Right, I get or, it. Uh, yeah, how drunk people are or, or how interested they are in comedy or or whether they've just come for a, a night out, they've just come out to get to have a drink and I don't really care about comedy that much, then I'd have a set for that, for that audience and then I'd have... Uh, I might do other stuff for audiences that are a bit more... Slightly more sober and slightly more there for the comedy than yeah, yeah. than a night out. But it, I, if you're going to take a take a gig, whatever gig you take, you have to respect that yeah. that audience and try and bring and bring something they're going to like. What a wonderful thing! Uh, um, uh, uh, a free speech comedy club, and uh, slightly sad as well because it should be every fucking comedy club. And. Uh, <laughs> It isn't. It used to be, but it isn't anymore. It's silly, you know. It's silly pandering to people who get upset and offended by things. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you made a joke and it hurt my feelings, Andrew. <laughs> you hurt my feelings. Well, clearly, I didn't make a very good job of it because <laughs> you stood there telling me all about it. <laughs> Next time I try a little bit harder, hopefully you'll fucking kill yourself. What about that? You're in the midst of um, doing a talk or clean, is that right? Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. And um, you know, you were, you know, I guess the well, the synopsis would be, you know, no no smart, no politics. You know, I mean. What are your thoughts behind that? I mean, you know, why, why did he go for that angle? Well, I, I think it was more the, the key thing with it was the no politics um, thing because I'd spent since it's about 2013, 2014, I, I'd had a kind of um, exhausting time kind of, um, sort of tackling sort of criticism, people wanting me to justify the dark comedy that I, I was doing that I'd always done since I started in about 2003. It's my sense of humour. It's just very dark and, and kind of uh, inappropriate and, and um, saying the things that you're not supposed to supposed to say, but kind of a strange climate emerged in it where, where, um, where people want to politicise what you're doing as a comedian and I, I felt like I'd spent a lot of time, four or five years, fighting that and, and, and trying to trying to avoid justifying myself or avoid trying to get into too much of a debate about it. And and uh, I hadn't really managed that. And, and there were all kinds of things being written about me in, you know, in, in, in fairly prominent publications that, that were absolute nonsense based on funny things or, or, or that, that I put on social media, the piece, people who willfully misrepresented or, or chosen to misinterpret because they... Because it gave them an angle for whatever they were doing, and I just got exhausted with that. So I thought, what can I do to get away from this for a little while? I need a break from this. So, 
by doing a clean show, it was kind of killing off all those people who were sort of feeding on this idea of me being this controversial um, comedian that was that was doing something, I don't know, toxic or, or, or negative on stage. But that's really interesting because actually when you describe the early stages of your, your career, that's what you were celebrated for, isn't it? Doing things that are that are subversive. Sure, but I, yeah, and I really think the comedy, there's a risk-reward thing, thing there where... You've got to you judge a room and you know where the audience's line is and you get as close to that as possible. And the closer you can get to that, the bigger the laugh, the bigger the round of applause. Um, uh, but if you step over it, then, <laughs> then you know, there's, as it used to be, the, the crowd might turn against you and oh, well, we don't like this guy anymore, you might have to win them back. But now the risk wall thing is if, if you tread over the line, you might lose your career. <laughs> um, so... It's, uh, yeah, in terms of weighing up the risk, the, the rewards of, of doing that darker stuff, it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, there's a lot more at stake. I think that's one of the worst jobs you could do if you're a woman uh, working in an abortion clinic. It must be awful. Imagine you're walking in. 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning, walking into work every day, people in the office across the road watching you thinking, there she goes again? (laughs) She never learns? I mean, did you get a lot of blowback? I mean, obviously, I mean, you obviously did uh, after 2014, 2015. I mean, how, how did you handle that? Well, should we contextualise what what happened? There? Yeah, yeah, like, of course. Do you yeah, want to yeah. sort of? I know people know about this, but what what sort of happened? Sure, I, I spent sort of years on on Twitter and Facebook to a, a lesser extent, just just doing what I was doing on stage and and, and putting up stuff that was was willfully kind of trying to wind people up, I suppose, and and, and trying to say the worst possible thing that was going to get people's backs up because of course for a lot of people that's very funny when they know that's what you're doing but it's it's a question of when people know you're a comedian and you're doing that they they realize or or anyone most people realize what you're doing you're a comedian they they know you they've seen you on tv or they've heard you on the radio or or whatever and it says on your biography that you're a comedian and 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 then you put this stuff down. The, the, obviously, it's not supposed to be taken seriously, um, but of course, can, people can if they choose to. So I'm going to I'm going to take this seriously. I'm, I'm going to. In some ways, they've got every right to do that because the, the context of social media is not the context of a stand-up comedy gig. And and so, uh, yeah, the, the risks of being misrepresented are, are far greater than if you're on stage behind a mic where the, the sign on the stage behind you says comedy. And, and I think that's there's a, a greater awareness with amongst comedians of that now that, that you mm. kind of have to be careful about what you put on social media. But but for years on Twitter, that's everybody was it was a free for all, wasn't it? And and yeah. everyone was having fun. It's very very funny, and uh, and uh, the same with Facebook. And there came a a turning point, didn't there? And where people started, that there, there was the shaming culture came along. And I think I was quite close to to the start of that. I, I didn't really have much awareness of that that was going on in whatever it was, 2014, when I put this this very very just sort of provocative uh, post on, on on Facebook, which was uh, which was kind of uh, misrepresented. And, and uh, what what were you saying? I wasn't saying anything. I, I suppose I was trying to wind. The, I, I, I suppose I'd noticed more and more on Twitter and Facebook people being very pious about certain subjects and so I suppose I wanted to do what I'd always done in my comedy is, is say the worst thing I could possibly say um, yeah you did in, that in, in, <laughs> in, in, in juxtaposition yeah, yeah. to these very yeah. sort of pious quite sort of uh, fake people who were uh, you know as, as the term became no, virtue signalling so but it's very difficult it's so, what is it, five six years ago now and uh, so that, that, that happened and there was a, a kind of Massive reaction against that. And in this Facebook post, I kind of, um, you know, I was talking in quite a caustic way about sort of TV panel shows and how everyone was very kind of smug and, and sort of lefty liberal and there was no there was no kind of um, variation in, in tone and, and sort of criticising that. 
Um, As in, like, a spectrum of opinion? Uh, uh, or... Oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but also criticising the fact that it was actually unrepresentative of, of what a lot of people were feeling uh, at that time, which there was a, there was a kind of... Uh, there was a sort of growing unease about sort of mass uncontrolled immigration about a lot of pe- amongst a lot of people, uh, and there were certainly political groups who'd been ex- uh, who were exploiting that. But it wasn't a discussion that was being had in in, in public forums or in culture, and, and it wasn't something comedians that were doing material about. It was a very taboo, a very taboo subject, the, the subject of, of immigration, uh, and it's not something an area you could. You could go into and try and be funny, but then you're drawn to that. Well, I, I'm drawn to that as a comedian because of the risk or all thing. If I can get this right, were you, were you trying to be funny, funny in the post? Or? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and, um, because I don't think it was read that way. It wasn't absolutely no, it wasn't, mm. and that's the danger of social media, isn't it? If people had seen me do it on stage, they would have understood the context. Even if it hadn't worked, they would have understood I was trying to be funny, and they should have understood that by the fact that you know I'm a comedian. On social media and everything else I put up is an attempt at, um, at humour. But, uh, yeah, there was a massive kind of uh, backlash, particularly from, from within the comedy industry, because I think, I, th- I think it hit home. I think the criticism hit home a little bit. And people who are very high-profile people like Frankie Bourne and, and Dara Breen, who really shouldn't... And Stuart Lee, who shouldn't... Have, why would they bother with me? No, I know who I am, you know. And, and the, the fact that they... they actually gave up their time to, to, to write things in national newspapers, kind of uh, just denying any credence to, 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 to this thing that I put on, on Facebook and saying, oh, no, comedy is a bit, you know, it's not just a lefty liberal bubble and this guy's an idiot or whatever. The fact that they've spent time doing it, think, well, you know, why have you done that? Because no-one knows who I am anyway. Why, why has this riled you so much? And uh, It was a very strange time, and I spent sort of four or five years kind of having to... Talk about that all, all the time, which and of course I'm. I'm <laughs> yeah, I know. We I shouldn't have mentioned back, it really. Back into, <laughs> back into it. People, people still talk about it. That's yeah, the well, point. They made, yeah. they made a documentary about it, and that I agreed to do, which was was a kind of um, the, the sky which, which was uh, yeah, which you know might not have been a right thing to do, but they offered me a lot of what I felt was a lot of money at the time, and I felt oh well, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to turn that down, but, I, you know, the whole thing was, was crazy and, and, and blown out of uh, all proportion massively, but it it did have a, a sort of impact on my work in terms of there were venues who now wouldn't book me because they thought I was, so, I was too controversial based on what they'd read about me in newspapers rather than watching my act. So I lost bookings there, and, and even now there are places where I, I, I perform for years where... where they know I'm good at what I do and, and, and they know I'm going to deliver for them and it's going to be a great night. But they, they now won't book me because they imagine I'm too controversial uh, because of stuff they've read read in newspapers or online or whatever. So I needed to take a take a break from that and probably because I was exhausted with having to talk about the same thing all the time and I just wanted to remind people I just tell jokes that's all I, I do uh, I don't really care I don't I'm not really I don't have any political affiliations I, I, I kind of if I see a target and I think that needs taking the piss out of and uh, no one's doing it here yeah, there's a little niche for me this mm. might this might help my career yeah. <laughs> then I go for it was and, there a, um, I mean in, in a way in a point that you could see it as also like a possibly a critique of what comedy is in a way where you know there was a lot of in panel shows and such and such would be easy jokes and lazy jokes that were done which is what you know a lot of people also did take i mean not to keep on harping on about you know post and whatnot but i mean because you'd find you know there's a lot of people who are agreeing with what the way comedy is and when you watch uh, terrestrial tv it's sure. just the case of life well it's, it's funny you know it, it, it certainly attracted a new audience of people to my tour shows and, and my the numbers the ticket sales for my tour shows went up and my edinburgh shows went up but i was selling a lot more tickets which, which was great but at the same time there, there was this false impression out there of me of, of what i was doing and and who I was, and this this idea that I was politically engaged in some way, which I I wasn't really, and I was just try always just trying to go for the joke and, and go for a gag, but but the sick joke, the dark joke, right. because that's my sense of humour, and that's what I find funny, and that's what you do as a comedian, you work on your instincts, 
And if you think something's funny, you put it on stage. You know, I, I um, so now people I, are interpreting people interpret your comedy through a political lens. In other words, now, yeah, well, that well, that's it. It, it gets, um, and that's the same with all, all comedy now, isn't it? It gets uh, dissected and 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 politicised, um, which is not good for comedy, I don't think. Freelance comedian, you've got to be hustling, looking for work on the phone, chasing gigs. I, uh, I phoned a production company last week I used to do a lot of work for, and um, I said, what's going on, guys? I don't hear from you anymore. What's happening? And they said, comedy's changed, Andrew. <laughs> what do you mean? It's all about equality and diversity now. But I, I'm still funny. Well, it's not really about that, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I've got good jokes. No one wants to hear jokes now, Andrew. <laughs> no one wants to hear jokes. What do they want to hear? They want to hear you say something socially aware on a contentious issue, Andrew. That's all they want to hear. <laughs> so they can agree with you, nod their heads and clap their hands. Well, uh, uh, that's not really... I don't have anything like that, do you? I've <laughs> <laughs> got family to support. you got nothing for me? Sorry, Andrew, sorry. What about your partner? Is she funny? Well, yes, yeah, the moment's there. Uh, could she stand on stage chatting for ten minutes? Probably. I, I imagine she could. But is she available next Tuesday evening for a recording of Live at the Apollo? Hang on! <laughs> she hasn't done the stage time. She hasn't got the experience. You put her in a pressure cooker environment like that, she's probably going to die a horrible death. Doesn't matter, Andrew. We fix all that in the edit these days. It's the magic of technology. <laughs> we put her in next Tuesday evening, Live at the Apollo, Andrew. Trouble is, she's only ticking one equality and diversity box at the moment. Any other boxes she could tick for us? Any dis- Disabilities. Oh, not really, no. Could she put on a limp? Well, I... <laughs> how much are you going to pay her? It's 12 grand for live at the Apollo, Andrew. For 12 grand, she'd probably sit in a wheelchair for you. <laughs> Ask her nicely, she'd probably dribble down herself. I don't know. <laughs> This is the worry, isn't it? It's now, what is your intention? What is the intention behind that? People are now reinterpreting yeah. Louis C.K.'s material on the basis of allegations, sexual assault allegations. Well, I mean, he just did that small, you know, um, sound recording. Yes, the, the, the leaked know, set. The leaked set, and then, yeah. you know, there, there was a huge blowback, you know, the, the New York Times and whatever. Yeah, but, but, but he's always been doing that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But that's, uh, and that's, uh, once there's this idea about Louis C.K. out here that he's this, this monster which is, you know, it's, it's not a great way, it's horrible. What he did, I think, but once that idea is out, out there, there's this justification amongst people, so, well, it's OK for us to, tr- to, to sort of destroy his... Uh, or, or, or stop him working now, or sabotage what, sabotage what he's trying to do, which those leaked recordings of, of his work, of what was, what was the, the opening five minutes of a new set he's, he'd been working on, that's your opening... Yeah, of your show, which is incredibly valuable to a comedian, probably might be your opening and your, and your, the closing of your show, your most valuable assets as, as a comedian when you're you're creating a show. So if you're putting out there, you're you're recording it and, and putting it putting that opening out there, then it, it's um it's it's a real kind of act act of, of vandalism and, and sabotage, mm-hmm. I think, and I think that act is 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 very bad in itself. And uh, what he did was was, was horrible, but can you look at what what he's he's done and say, well, now we're justified in in sort of trying to destroy this art that he's creating or stop him, yeah, doing what he does because what he does is on stage is phenomenal. But that's the problem. It's isn't absolutely it? phenomenal, and um, it's really difficult because there, there comes a point when if you stop him doing that, you're punishing the people who go see him and love what he does. There are millions of people. And how do you punish him without destroying the incredible stuff that he does on stage and and, and, and the people that love it? And um, I, I think it's nonsense to try and reinterpret what he's doing on stage in, in, in context of, of those actions off stage. He's a professional comedian. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't act very professionally off stage, but, <laughs> but, but anyone who, who watches what he does on stage, he's going for a laugh. He's going for a laugh. That, that's what he's doing, and he's doing it very, very well. Having said that, since this happened to him, and since what he did, the consequences of that, that's clearly affected what he does on stage as well. If you were him, you would probably say, 
take a couple of years, take three, four years, five years, just to get this out of your head, just to get this bitterness and, and anger about what's happened to you out of your head, because I, I, I'm sure in his head, this incredible injustice, he, he feels this, there's this incredible injustice that has been done to him. It's so extreme, so, it's such an extreme thing that's gone on with him. How can he not take that on stage and how can that not pollute what he's doing a little bit and detract from the humour? You know, if you can, you can afford to, which, which hmm. I'm sure you can. But some of the material, though, that people took years. umbrage at was things like a jokes about non-binary people, which yeah. has absolutely nothing to do with the allegations. And, no, yeah, and actually, sure, absolutely. and when I watched the clip, mm. I heard the clip, sorry, um, it made me laugh. It was really yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, and my problem is this bad faith interpretation that if I come along thinking you're a nasty piece of work, so now I'm going to reinterpret what you're saying about non-binary people yeah. as aggressive and unpleasant. But actually, I don't think it is. No, no. And well, that, that's nonsense to interpret that in, in, in that way. And then the, there's another little bit, isn't the, the, wasn't there, where the, a little bit about how much money has cost him, which, you know, he's saying that he, he, he says he's saying him, himself up for that, that sort of backlash, isn't, isn't he? So, yeah. Isn't that what we do, though? We talk about things that have happened What's to us it? and, like... Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly but, but there's always distance. For me, there's always distance. If I talk about something that, that's happened to me, it's that whole thing of there being time. There has to yeah. be that, the, the, the um, I mean, tragedy this. plus time is coming. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, if it's something he's still really angry about, which I, I would be, I'd be fucking furious if I was him. Uh, although I wouldn't ever masturbate in front of people, you know, <laughs> I don't, or indeed any people I was in a relationship with. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, well, well, yeah, they, they I, I, yeah, I think. But you still, if you're him, you're going to be fucking furious, mm. and um, but also deeply depressed about it because it's so what the humiliation of it, the downfall, and how can you not? How can you get that out of your head and walk on stage clear of that? I suppose what I mean is he's always... Sorry. Well, he's tried. I mean, he's tried a bit. I mean, um, with uh, with the league set, I mean, they now view him in a new prism, being um, he talks about the school shooting, which is, you know, just a hilarious, you know, bit that he did. Yeah. The new prism now is that they, they're taking things where he's saying it's as literal. Well, people are now saying he's endorsing to, school well, shooting. there you go. There, there. I mean, do you find with yourself, uh, I mean, in terms of trying to get away from certain labels or this, you know, people viewing you in a different way in that? I think if, if, if you've been through this experience of whatever it is on a, on a minor or massive scale where people have, there's been this, this sort of, well, for me, where there's been this social media thing where, where people have decided I'm, I'm something I'm not and it doesn't matter what I say or what I do on stage, that, 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 that impression is cemented and they're not going to, change their minds, you have to let that play out or I have to take a step back and do a clean shave for a year and a half so they're not even looking at me or thinking about me or talking about me because they re- maybe they read a review and it's a crappy review but it says, oh well, yeah, he's completely clean, there's nothing there that would offend anyone, so they think, oh well, there's nothing there for us to, to kick against then we can't, we can't make him into this monster that he's not if, if there's literally nothing there that, that we can um, latch onto and tap, on, tap into and, you know, I by doing that clean show, I, I was able to just focus on, on the comedy, on the jokes. I didn't have to justify myself or explain myself to these people who wanted to politicise what I, what I was doing. And, and, of course, that gets in your head. You think, maybe it is, maybe I am political. Maybe I have, yeah, maybe I'm, I am. That. And so it allowed me to get away from that and step back from that. And those people all that, that were criticising me lost interest, which was great, because um, I just focused on my comedy and... and uh, the jokes and those people don't not interested in me don't care about me anymore. So now, a year and a half down the line, I can go back to doing what I want to do. And those people have moved on. There's other monsters, or they 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 they've created other monsters for themselves mm-hmm. to kick against. And um, you know, at the time, I should have probably taken in in 2014 when I put this post on on Facebook and there was a massive backlash. At that time, I should have probably said. Let's take a break. Let's keep quiet for for a year or two. But I didn't do that. I, I stuck my head above the parapet and, and I, I kind of fought back with bit by being as funny as I could and, and, and being as outrageous as I could. But um, in a way where it was obvious I was, I was being funny or trying to be funny and make people laugh. But there was no... Once people, these certain sections of the internet had this, this impression of who I was and, and what I was, there, this, it's like a kind of blindness. They, they can't see the reality. 
uh, of the situation and um, so it's a battle you can't win or I, I couldn't win so after a couple of years where I, you know a lot of people turn out my tools and I was doing quite well and I, I got well paid for that documentary I thought well I'm exhausted with this I don't want to keep fighting with these people and I'm not interested in that either I, I only got into this to make people laugh to tell, tell jokes and that's what I'm going to do and if those jokes have to be utterly without any kind of risk or if, if they're willfully jokes I've come up with knowing they can't possibly offend anyone then that's what I'll do because I'm only interested in, in the laugh but then you know when this culture subsides or these people lose interest in me I'll do what, what I want to do because you know what's the point it's such a it's, it's a hard in many ways it's a hard life to stand up comedy because you, your income's insecure you're travelling constantly really anti-social hours and uh, you know it's, it's not a precise art for anybody the best comedians have good gigs and bad gigs and if you've been going 15, 20 years and you have 100 amazing gigs you walk on stage one night and have a horrible gig it still hurts and, and you take that away with you and you, you feel like a, a novice again so and there, there's lots of uh, you know, it, 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 it's hard in a lot of ways, so you have to do what you want to do because you're uncompromising to get into stand-up in the first place. said, so I'm not going to do... I'm not going to go a normal route. I'm not going to get a day job and go down this conventional route. I'm going to try and make a living. At, at night time, stood on stage saying things, trying to make people laugh. You've made this, this fairly... Uh, this very arrogant and very kind of um, uncompromising decision, so you have to do... You have to do what you want to do up there. As long as it's funny, um, mm. if you want to get paid. But the trouble is, you, in, in the culture that, or, or the past four or five years, as things have been, the trouble is, you can be on stage and, and, and be doing certain sorts of jokes, certain humour, and it is funny. Everyone's laughing, but then there's this whole thing of, of blogs and, and, and journalists writing that you're doing something else. You're not. To, you're on stage saying people, saying people jokes, and everyone's laughing. And the next day, you'll read on on some internet comedy site that you're, you know, um, right-wing comedian or the most, you know, controversial comedian or, or, you know, everyone was... It was an uncomfortable, uneasy environment. Think, Hang on a second. Mm -hmm. I told jokes and everyone pissed themselves with laughter. That's my job. And why are you misrepresenting that? You're the one with the agenda. Uh, my agenda is just comedy, just telling jokes. But there's a... There is a, a, a group of journalists in comedy, a small group of journalists who I, I feel put their personal politics above their professional responsibilities. And um, if the truth of what they've watched on stage doesn't suit their worldview and their politics, then they're quite happy to write about it in a way that's that's not truthful. Well, I say that, but oh, of course you can't know what goes on inside people. Perhaps to them it is, their delusion is such that they've managed to block out the laughter in the room or, or the reality of what's going on on stage. But, but no, I think everyone's seen that. I think every yeah. comedian knows yeah. that. Absolutely, that, that, yeah. that, that, that. There is a coterie of, com uh, of critics who will yeah. well, misrepresent for an agenda. Uh, absolutely. We all, we all well, then it, it's yeah. up to the, the comics and... and um, you know, whatever the promoters or the agents to kick against that, yeah. because it's it's a negative thing, and it's 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 damaging the industry and it's creating divisions in the industry. There are now groups of specific groups of comics that do different certain things that sort of have their own circles, mix their own circles, and do a certain circuit of gigs, and then another group does another circuit of gigs. It wasn't like that mm. ten years ago. There was one circuit, and we all worked on it to an extent of greater or lesser success but we we were all there and it was a community and we were all working together and we were all appreciative of what and respectful of what, what we were doing I think if, if a lot of comedians see this as you say and then it's, it's up to it's up to us to kick against it and yeah. people don't no, people don't we could talk for hours I've got a lot to say about this but I think we should wrap it up probably yeah 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 yeah, yeah absolutely. Andrew thanks so much really it's appreciate pleasure. it yeah that's it, more or less. My uh, my comedy is um, it's very much like uh, a Jew's penis. <laughs> Doesn't have a proper ending. Uh... <laughs> is that the time? Uh... <laughs> You've been lovely. Please keep supporting this incredible club, and uh, maybe see you all again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Right, that's it for now. 
check out the Comedy Unleashed YouTube channel or Facebook page. We're also on Twitter. And if you'd like to see the full lineups for future gigs, check out comedyunleashed.co.uk. We hold gigs on the second Tuesday of every month, and it would be great to see you there. Lastly, don't forget to click on the subscribe button for the Comedy Unleashed podcast. And then as we drop new interviews with comedians as they come off stage or are about to go on stage, uh, then they will drop into your podcast app. Lovely. See you next time.